Hello and welcome to our special coverage of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. I am Ladi Akri Dunwale, the headlines. EU reaches compromise deal on banning Russian oil imports. First ship leaves Mariupol since Russia took the city, carrying metal cargo. Ukraine calls it looting. Turkey makes suggestions for Russian-Ukraine talks. We begin this morning with news from the meeting of the leaders of the European Council. EU members spent hours struggling to resolve their differences over a ban on oil imports from Russia, with Hungary its main opponent. And now they have reached a deal on banning such imports. European Commission Chief Ursula von der Leyen said the leaders agreed to court 90% of oil imports from Russia by the end of 2022. Mrs. von der Leyen added that the remaining 10% will be temporarily exempt from the embargo so that landlocked Hungary, which was the main holdout for a deal, along with Slovakia and the Czech Republic, that are all connected to the southern leg of a pipeline, have access which they cannot easily replace. She added that the EU leaders' deal would clear the way for other elements of a sixth package of EU sanctions on Russia to take effect, including cutting Russia's biggest bank, Sperbank from the SWIFT messaging system and banning three more Russian state-owned broadcasters. Glad to agree in principle um, on the six uh, sanctions package. Um, this is very important. Thanks to this, um, Council should now be able to finalize a ban on almost 90% of all Russian oil imports by the end of the year. This is an important step forward. Um, now left over is the around about 10 or 11 percent that are covered by the southern uh, Dushpa. And indeed here we have agreed, agreed, this is for the moment being exempted, we have agreed to, uh, that the Council will revert to the topic as soon as possible in one way or the other. So um, this is a topic where we will we'll come back to and uh, where we will still have to work on. But it is a big step forward, what we did today. Um, so this is good that we now de-swift the spare bank. Um, there is a ban on insurance and reinsurance of Russian ships by EU companies, a ban on providing Russian companies with a whole range of business services, and very important, the suspension of broadcasting in the European Union of three further Russian state outlets um, that were um, very typically uh, spreading broadly the misinformation that uh, we have witnessed over the last weeks and months, um, this procedure. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank, Thank you, you, President. Foreign Minister Dmitry Kuleba says Ukraine is fed up with, quote, special solutions and separate models for its integration into the European Union and wants full membership. French President Emmanuel Macron this month suggested creating a European political community that would create a new structure allowing closer cooperation with countries seeking EU membership. Mr. Kuleba, after a meeting with his French counterpart Catherine Colonna in Kiev, says, quote, we need a clear legal affirmation that Ukraine is a part of the European integration project, and such an affirmation would be the granting of candidate status. France has tried to reassure Kiev that an invitation uh, to forge closer ties between the bloc and aspiring members would not replace their bids to join. Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky, who held the meeting with Mrs. Colonna later, said Kiev was counting on French support for granting Ukraine the status of an EU candidate. Meanwhile, France has called for an investigation after a French journalist was killed in Ukraine when shelling hit the vehicle he was traveling in that was being used for the evacuation of civilians near the city of Severodonetsk. Foreign Minister Katrina Kolona called the incident a crime during a ceremony with Ukrainian fighters in Kiev. The governor of Ukraine's Luhansk region, Serhir Hare, said in a post on the messaging service Telegram that an armored transport vehicle was hit by shrapnel from a Russian shell, killing the journalist. 
Turkey is ready to host a new round of negotiations between Kiev and Moscow in Istanbul and is offering to facilitate the reopening of Ukrainian ports. And that's according to the President Recep Tayyip Erdogan. He made the offer to his Russian counterpart of Vladimir Putin during a phone call. Mr. Erdogan noted the need for steps that would minimize the negative effects of a war and build trust by restoring, as soon as possible, the grounds for peace between Russia and Ukraine. During the discussion of the situation, emphasis was placed on ensuring safe navigation in the Black and Azov seas, as well as the elimination of mine threats in their waters. That's the Kremlin said of Mr. Putin's call with Mr. Erdogan. For his part, Ankara said Mr. Erdogan told Mr. Putin that peace needed to be established as soon as possible and that Turkey was ready to take on a role in an observation mechanism between Moscow, Kiev and the United Nations if an agreement was reached. Lithuania's president has told lawmakers gathering for the NATO Parliamentary Assembly that Russian President Vladimir Putin aims to destroy the entire Euro-Atlantic security architecture. Gitanas de Suda says Russia should be seen as a long-term threat to the Euro-Atlantic area, and member countries of NATO and the European Union should help Ukraine become a member of the European and Euro-Atlantic family. The speakers of the Finnish and Swedish parliaments, who have both applied to join the alliance, also addressed NATO member lawmakers. Finland's Marty van Hanin said the situation with neighboring Russia forced his country to reassess its non-alignment policy. His Swedish counterpart said Stockholm's NATO bid was made in the light of Russia's invasion of Ukraine and in close dialogue with Finland. ...security situation around us. Putin started with Ukraine, but obviously he has bigger plans, such as destroying the entire Euro-Atlantic security architecture. Firstly, we must realize that the Russian threat will not disappear for years to come. Thus, we must clearly name Russia as a key and long-term threat to the entire Euro-Atlantic area. We have to provide Ukraine with all the weapon systems needed. And not only that, we must consolidate our unity and determination to help Ukraine to become a member of European and Euro-Atlantic family. We have not done the decision to apply for membership likely, as the military non-alignment has served us well during the past decades. This decision is based on a democratic process and a comprehensive analysis on the change in our security environment. The application has very solid support in the Swedish parliament. Nearly 90% of the members are in favor. Um, one of many signs that this is a time of great change. As noted in a recent debate in the Swedish parliament, a vast majority assessed the membership application to be a necessary measure in the light of Russia's brutal invasion of Ukraine and thereby its attack on the European security order. This decision was taken in close dialogue with Finland. Let's take a look now at the key eastern city of Severodonetsk, where Russian forces are mounting a major offensive. Luhansk regional governor Serhiy Hade wrote in Telegram that the situation is as complicated as possible and added that the entire region was under continuous bombardment. He also spoke to Ukrainian state television early in saying the fighting goes on. All the remaining territory under Ukrainian control is being shelled, according to him. And while Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky remains very concerned about the situation in the eastern region of Donbass, where Ukrainian troops are battling a massive Russian offensive, uh, Russia's foreign minister, Sergei Lavrov, says the liberation of the Donbass is an unconditional priority. During a daily televised speech, Mr. Zelensky also says Russia's blockade of Ukrainian grain destabilizes the situation on a global scale and increases the threat of hunger in Africa, Asia, and certain countries in Europe. Russian President Vladimir Putin, meanwhile, said Moscow was ready to facilitate grain exports from Ukrainian ports 
a possibility that could alleviate a food crisis as the war and the West's attempt to isolate Russia have sent the price of grain and other commodities soaring. In his nightly address, Mr. Zelensky said Russian troops shelled Kharkiv, injuring several people and setting houses on fire a day after he visited the city. They said they do not want to allow a crisis, but sanctions supposedly stop them. It is clear that they lie, as they usually do. First, Russian food was not blocked by sanctions. Second, in our captured land, the Russian occupier stole at least half a million grains and are searching for how to sell them somewhere on the black market to sell in a way to make money on the stolen goods and maintain a deficit on a legal market. Today, Russian troops shelled Kharkiv again. The territory of our Sumy region was also shelled across the border between Ukraine and Russia. The fight for the Kherson region continues, step by step, we are liberating our land and gradually approaching the point where Russia will, in the end, have to lay down its arms, count all its dead and move to diplomacy. It will definitely have to. A pro-Russia cargo vessel loaded with steel was seen docked in the Ukrainian port of Mariupol yesterday. The metal was reportedly expected to be shipped to Russia in a move Kiev described as looting. A spokesperson for the port told TASS news agency that the vessel would be loading 2,700 tons of metal before traveling 160 kilometers east to the Russian city of Rostov-on-Don in the following days. The spokesperson did not say where the metal being shipped had been produced. Ukraine's human rights ombudsman, Lyudmila Denisova, said the shipment amounted to looting by Russia. Russia seized full control of Mariupol last week when more than 2,400 Ukrainian fighters surrendered at the besieged Azovstal steelworks on the Azov Sea. Let's speak now to Commodore Olua Toyi Olaumi, ex-Deputy Director of Defense uh, and Intelligence Experts. He joins us uh, virtually. Good morning to you, uh, Komodo. Uh, thank you for your time this morning. Thank you for having me. Good morning. We are hearing, uh, of course, the usual from both sides, uh, and therefore it's a bit uh, difficult to know what the actual situation on the ground is. But some of those I have spoken to have said that this was expected, that because in spite of all the help that Ukraine has gotten, uh, the Russians are simply too strong and that their objectives will eventually uh, be achieved. Is that a fair comment, given what has happened in the last 13 weeks? Yeah, thank you for that topic. And um, what we need to understand, first of all, is that there are about five uh, stages of war. And uh, the, the, the first stage is actually to shape your forces. And the second one is to use those shaping of the forces to deter the enemy. Um, what the Russian has the third stage, when the the sanctions trying to dominate the uh, the theater, and it's just too early for anybody to really predict because. We're still going to have another stage, which is destabilization, and the final stage, which is to enable a that objective. So for us to actually uh, speculate that the Russians are uh, going to achieve the objective, I think it's too early in the day. And uh, if we also want to interrogate the essence or when you talk about the objective of war, uh, if the objective of war, as uh, speculated by Sun Tzu, is to actually compile, compare your enemy to do your will, uh, I, I really don't think Russia is going to achieve that. And if you look at also the aim of warfare,
it's, um, uh, the Russians are going to achieve that. So uh, theoretically, if those are the objectives and the aim of war, I, I wouldn't think that in the longer run, Russia is going to achieve it. To, we seem to have uh, problems uh, with... We seem to be having problems with you, Commodore. Can you can you hear me? I, I can hear you clearly. Okay, in that case, please go on. Yeah, the, the 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 only thing I think the Russians will achieve in the longer run is to just get a portion of Donbas, uh, but to achieve the critical objective of of making the Ukrainians to do the will of Russia is going to is going to happen. It's not attainable at this time. But the, the people who said the statement that I mentioned earlier are points to the fact that systematically and that that part of it is not being very well uh, exposed or very well reported, that systematically, uh, slowly but surely, Russia is destroying uh, all the critical and even non-critical infrastructure in Ukraine roads, bridges, hospitals, schools, and all of that. Uh, so that at the end of the day, even if it does not conquer Ukraine, there, there won't be much left uh, by, by the end of all of this. Yeah, you know, usually in war, what, what military guys do, or what, is, what they're good at doing is to destroy places, you know, damage things, kill people. But for us that are in the in the trade, uh, we know that is not really the objective. Because, you know, as I said earlier, you know, uh, war is like a parabola, you know? You, you have the beginning, you have the crescendo, then you have the termination phase. Uh, you can kill as many people as possible, you can destroy as many bridges and houses as possible. But if you ask Putin, that is not the objective of that war. That is not the objective. And as long as you are not attaining the objectives, you can keep on killing people. Look at the Second World War. Hitler did more than this. But at the end, he lost. So we should not be looking at the damages or the uh, immediate um, gains that, the, that Putin is doing. In the long run, the, 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 the Russians are going to suffer tremendously for this. For we that were historians of war, Look at the Peloponnesian War. Look at the First World War. Look at the Battle of the Sofreno. And now look at the Second World before the Cold War. What Russia is doing is futile. It's futile. It's just going to actually get its people into trouble. Because by the time the history of this war is going to be told in another 20 years, 30 years, we are going to see clearly the folly, the stupidity of Russians. You cannot actually try to compel a people to do your will because you are afraid that the NATO expansion is going to um, maybe have uh, a negative uh, effect on, on Russia. So even if you damage the bridges, kill people, I think in the long run, he's going to lose. And some of those areas that he has damaged are going to be rebuilt. Look at Japan. After the Hiroshima and Nagasaki, um, the, the, the countries were rebuilt. And the Europeans are already uh, massing up a lot of funds to rebuild uh, Ukraine. So Ukraine is going to be rebuilt. But at the end of the day, Putin is going to be subjected to the trash of history. And I think uh, it's better for him to look for a way out of this uh, uh, misadventure, as I would call it. Those things we are seeing are just uh, what war is all about. But at the long run, the objective is not going to be met. I've always said this. Russia is not going to achieve the objective of that war. Indeed, Commodore Olaume, thank you for uh, your time. We were having a, a bit of difficulty towards the beginning with uh, the connection, but then we could then eventually get to hear you. Thank you so much for your time this morning. It's really a pleasure to have you. Thank you. After the break, Russian oil exports to India multiply by 25 to reach 24 million barrels in May. Join us again.
Welcome back. Thanks for staying tuned. A video released last night showed Ukrainian rescuers extinguishing a fire at a meat production facility in the aftermath of an attack at a location given as the southern city of Mykolaiv. The video showed debris inside the destroyed building and people carrying slaughtered pigs. Russian shelling continued yesterday across several regions, such as in Anovibu in Mykolaiv region and Sumy. The city council in Novibu said on its Telegram channel that a Russian missile attack had caused considerable damage in the city center. The state news agency RIA reports that the Kherson and Zaporizhia regions now under Russian control have switched over to Russia's mobile and internet network. Oleg Kurchov said, quote, in the liberated territories, it is now exclusively Russian internet and communications. In fact, this is the end of the Ukrainian propaganda as uh, Zelensky's towers of lies have fallen. That's according to him. RIA reports that the occupying military civilian administration in Kherson has asked Moscow whether it could use the capabilities of Russian telecommunication companies to restore cellular communications in the region. A request reportedly came after shelling by Ukrainian forces. And Russian forces also shelled the northern outskirts of Kharkiv, injuring several people and setting houses on fire a day after Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky had visited the city. A spokesman for the rescue services in the region said the shelling uh, by Grad and Smudge missiles set several houses and civilian structures on fire in the village of Zukovsky, a suburb of Kharkiv. Ukrainian troops are defending Kharkiv, the country's second largest city, had repelled Russian forces, pushing them back to the border earlier this month, but the city remains within the range of Russian artillery. A Ukrainian rocket launcher was spotted amongst other military vehicles driving on a road in Jonesk as Russia focused its offensive across the eastern region of Donbass. Russia has concentrated its firepower on the last major population center still held by Ukrainian forces in eastern Luhansk province in a push to achieve one of President Vladimir Putin's stated objectives after three months of war. Incessant shelling has left Russian forces, uh, Ukrainian forces rather, defending ruins in several Donetsk, but their refusal to withdraw has slowed the wider Russian offensive across the Donbas region, large parts of which are already controlled by Moscow-backed separatists. Let's talk now to Professor Dapo Thomas. Uh, he is an international relations expert and lectures at the Lagos State University. He joins us virtually. Thank you very much, Prof. Good morning to you. Are you able to hear me, Prof? Yes, I'm, I'm listening. I'm hearing you. Can I hear you? Thank you very much for your time this morning. I, I, I wanted to start by asking you, do you think now uh, Turkey is uh, proposing peace talks. Do you think both sides, uh, after these 13 weeks of grueling fighting and all the damage and destruction and all the losses, will be ready to sit down? Well, there is no, there is no time that uh, this process cannot take place. Uh, diplomacy is always constant in many situations, whether it's a war scenario, or whether it's a normal um, conflict. But whatever it is, I, I still believe that uh, because the two parties would realize that this, this, this war cannot continue this way. They have to end it one way or the other. And it has to be true dialogue, and it has to be true this kind of peace process, which uh, Erdogan is trying to uh, coordinate. I only I only think and pray that he will be able to uh, achieve some notable objective, I mean, some progress, or just let, let us believe that he will make some progress this time around, because the first one was uh, a big flop. But this time around, let us believe that uh, he, would have, he would have reflected on what happened during the first process um, and then maybe 
he has already plugged all the holes, you know, which are which should be plugged to achieve some meaningful progress during the second peace process. Uh, and I believe that he is, is, is likely to make some headway, you know, because I believe that the first some of the issues that arose possibly on the Russian side and on the Ukrainian side will have been addressed by now. And that's why he's confident that uh, can go on for the second uh, meeting. Um, factors, shall we call them, that uh, President Erdogan is not in control of. There are some, uh, pardon my use of that uh, pun, flies in the ointment. Uh, one of them is the European Union, uh, which has just uh, announced an agreement uh, just as uh, President Erdogan was proposing these talks, it has just announced an agreement uh, to ban two-thirds of uh, Russian oil exports, uh, going up to 90% uh, by the end of uh, this year. Uh, so there are disincentives uh, for either party uh, to participate. Russia itself has increased uh, its attacks uh, at almost the same time and has moved to looking for customers elsewhere. So uh, President Erdogan may have a really tough task uh, at this point because there are others who, pardon my, 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 my statement in this respect, don't want the war to end at this point. Well, don't forget it's a war. So uh, for as long as the war is still intense this way. Uh, it is still going to continue to be like that. However, those who are engaged in the conflict, those who are fighting the war will still continue. It does not stop this process. It does not stop engagement. It is a constructive, uh, peaceful engagement. So they will still be talking, and then the war will still be going on. For as long as they have not uh, discussed a kind of ceasefire. Well, maybe though it is during the discussion, during the, this particular meeting that uh, Erdogan is trying to put in place, that they will now be thinking of discussing a ceasefire first. Because I believe that it is inappropriate for the war or for Russia to continue to shell some of these um, cities and then still be talking. So maybe the first thing that the Ukrainians are going to push for would be a ceasefire. You know, there must be a ceasefire so that at least everybody can, uh, the two parties can see how far they have gone and what the extent of damage and then take uh, assessment, I mean, take uh, account or recording of what has happened, or what has transpired. And as such, it does not stop the peace process. So whether um, EU is a... Uh, imposing ban of 90% or not does not stop the peace process. The peace process will be going on. Sanctions can even be going on for as long as it is not the party that is initiating the peace process, that is also taking actions. Or, you know, Erdogan has been a bit neutral. In any case, it is completely, he is completely neutral, and that's why he can call for this kind of meeting. So he's not part of all the decisions that EU has been taking or NATO has been taking. He's a member of NATO too. And then he has not actually aligned it himself to some of the decisions or some of the actions taken against Russia. And that is why, because of his neutrality, everybody feels that, well, he's the only person who can initiate that place. It's definitely not US, not NATO, not EU. So he, uh, he is an influential member of NATO. He's a very influential member. And, uh, you know, we are still speculating whether he was going to allow uh, Finland and Sweden to the members of NATO, you know, so everybody needs, everybody knows that he has to be pacified. And, and as such, he, he too is playing some kind of influential role in this, in the ongoing uh, peace process. And if he, he knows that if he is able to achieve something credible, something constructive, something substantial in this war, then his name will go down in history as uh, the mediator and the peacemaker. Uh, I don't think that, that those factors are sufficient enough to stop him from doing his peace process engagement. He's going to continue with the peace engagement. So um, nothing is distracting him. You know, he was persistent the first and then the second one that is changing now. You know, so it, it now depends. But first, I would suggest that it should be 
Well, it's not the person that will talk about ceasefire. It may happen during the meeting, but I believe that India and Co and maybe China and even the US, well, the US has tried its best because I know that the defense secretary was in constant touch with his uh, counterpart in uh, Russia and he was uh, asking for a ceasefire, but which the most which Moscow has um, declined. So I I think that uh, the peace process issue can can be discussed while the meeting is on. So anything I mean dialogue can still go on. What can still continue? Paris Pasu. The two can go Paris Pasu. But I believe that in order to achieve any constructive uh, result or objective from the from the peace process or from the peace meeting, uh, there must be some ceasefire. That that then leaves something which you said in your answer there. Uh, the United States has been in touch with Russia about a ceasefire, but then the United States is asking for a ceasefire at the same time as it is um, participating in the tightening of the screws on Russia and continuing uh, with the aid, uh, military and otherwise, uh, to Ukraine. So in terms of, I mean, you're, you're, you're an international relations expert, and in terms of encouraging diplomacy, uh, I am told that to help the two sides see peace talks as a viable alternative, some carrots ought to be shared uh, to, to both sides uh, to encourage them to move towards uh, peace. So the question is, what kind of carrots can President Erdogan offer since he's neutral, he's not aiding either side, and as you pointed out, it is actually China and India on one hand, and then the United States, Britain, France, Germany, and the others on the other. What carrots can all those people bring to the table to encourage both sides, even if it is to agree first to a ceasefire, uh, to allow the atmosphere cool down, to encourage talks? Well, the only person, the only person that can be appeased now is uh, the is, is um, Moscow. Is Kremlin? Is the Kremlin? Is Putin? That's the only person that can be appeased now, that can be pacified now, or that can be talked spoken to. They need to talk to him because it's not the Ukrainians are defending. They are not the ones attacking. They are defending. So you need to talk to the person that is attacking to seize, I mean to 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 to, to stop. So if he does not stop, then that's 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 unfortunate. However, don't forget that um everybody, Modi, um Xi Jinping, uh, US. Erdogan um, and the, 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 the Macron, they have all spoken to even Boris, Boris yes, I mean, even uh, uh, Johnson, they have all spoken to uh, Putin, but he has declined, he has refused. So he is the only one who knows his game plan. But you know, I, I said something when I gave a lecture on this, that my, my whole position is that the major agenda is what I call list a uh, wasteland agenda. It's a wasteland agenda. He actually wants to level the whole of Ukraine if he's given the opportunity. And you know, now it, because it is every time that he continues to intensify his attack, to continue to shell, and then he deliberately, he deliberately fires at uh, residential buildings. In the old thing is the whole agenda is just to waste that land just i mean that's why i keep believing that it is a genocidal mission it's a genocidal mission or it's a way of filtrating you know just trying to bring some russians in fact some trying to annex forcefully ukraine as part of uh, russia so he's the only one that can be appeased he's the only one that can be spoken to he's the only one that they can appeal to Erdogan, uh, U.S., and everything. And then you are talking about uh, U.S. playing double role. Actually, I agree with you that this international system is it, it has inherent contradictions, inherent contradictions which all the parties, which all the parties, the U.S., the major powers essentially, which they are exploiting, you know, to their own advantage and everything. And then you don't forget, the United States has already said it out that their objective or what they actually, the, 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 the expected outcome of this war, what they expect to be the outcome of this war is to weaken Russia, either to weaken them in terms of their capabilities or to weaken them as a nation 
or to weaken them in whatever way, economically. So nobody understands that, that, that phrase, that their objective or their, uh, I mean, their, their objective or desire is to see that Russia is weakened. Now, um, Russia, as far as I'm concerned, is engaged in, in this war as a wasteland, I mean, based on certain agenda. And that is the wasteland agenda because it cannot continue to accommodate an arrogant nation or an arrogant nation or an arrogant president uh, presiding very close to it and it, it will not listen to uh, what he is saying or he would not take instructions from Russia and uh, would continue to take Russia, I mean, to take instructions from the United States, which is a far neighbor. So now he is, and then don't forget, Putin has one problem. And the problem is that he envies seriously the American presidency. He doesn't like the way, he doesn't like the kind of arrogance that U.S. is, I mean, that the U.S. presidency um, exhibits in the world system. So he also wants to contend. He wants to, he, want, he wants to compete for influence. He wants to compete for attention. He also wants to be seen all over the world as somebody that is that should be reckoned with. He enjoyed this kind of influence and status when Trump was there because he virtually subordinated Trump. But unfortunately, the Democrats, or let me say Biden now, cannot be subordinated because these are people who have, I mean, who knew. What they did when the when this when the Soviet was falling or when the Soviet was about to fall, when they were when they had problems economically, but 1989, you know, during the, the, the when the Cold War was about to end. So they knew how much they have pumped into Russia's economy. They knew how much they have given to Russia so that Russia will not fall. And then um putting out okay, yes, based on some of these rapprochement, rapprochement and everything, he interacted with the most of the nations, and then he, he blinded them in a way as to distract them so that they will continue to buy his oil. So when he had gathered sufficient funds to execute his plan and then to see that uh, it would be very difficult. But unfortunately, just like the first speaker said, that when the effect, the aftermath of this war starts coming up, he is going to suffer. He will definitely suffer because all these things will not have immediate effect. They have long-term effect, you know, economically, and then it's going to affect. And then possibly by the time he will have left off, so he will not even bother about reconstruction because even economically, Russia itself needs reconstruction. It's only that Ukraine needs physical and I mean rehabilitation and everything. They need reconstruction in terms of their physical, in the in terms of the destruction of some of their uh, buildings and everything. But Russia itself will have to reconstruct. Need image reconstruction. Needs. Um, social and even uh, uh, economic reconstruction, because not only economically, because socially, most of, I mean, for instance, World Cup, they have been edged out, uh, they have been removed, they have been banned, and also um, some of these, uh, the, the Wibbly Law now, they will not play. Some of these things will have, you know, you are becoming a pariah state, and it's, it will not correlate with its image as a world power. A world power that is shrinking in terms of image and status is going gradually. The only thing that is sustaining that image of world power that is sustaining, that is making Russia to still feel that is a world power is the nuclear capability. The absence of nuclear capability, Russia will have become a pariah by now. But once for as long as you still have the nuclear capability, you still have the impression that you are a world power. So that is the point. But I'm telling you economically, socially, in very near future, very soon, in the next six months or so, I'm also, the economy of Russia will continue to fall. Yes, India may increase its uh, import of oil. China may do all this. Some of these nations can continue to, but it's, there is no way to not tell. Don't forget, we are talking about Germany, I mean, uh, uh, living, Poland, not buying. We are talking of the entire EU, severing relations, I mean, Stopping to buy his oil is going to have and gas is going to have a lot of economic effect on it. So it, it, that, that of course is all, that of course is the situation, uh, Professor Thomas. Uh, we've completely run out of time. Yes. I want to thank you so much uh, uh, for your perspective this morning, Professor Dr. Thomas, is of the International Relations Department at Lagos State University. Thank you for your time this morning. You're welcome.
And as uh, Professor Thomas was saying there, India has received 34 million barrels of discounted Russian oil since February, more than 10 times the value of the total imports from the country year on year. According to Refinitiv Icon data, more than 24 million barrels of Russian crude were shipped this month, up from 7.2 million barrels in April and from about 2 million, uh, 3 million barrels in March. The data shows that the South Asian nation is set to receive about 28 million barrels in June. Last year, Russian crude exports to India averaged just under 960,000 barrels per month, brought roughly 25 times less than this month's total. Western sanctions on Moscow have created an opportunity for Indian refiners uh, to increase purchases of Russian oil at discounted prices, as some European customers have been vocally reluctant to buy Russian crude. India has come under fire from the West for its continued purchases of Russian oil. However, New Delhi has rebuffed the criticism, saying those imports make up a fraction of the country's overall needs. Authorities also said India will keep buying, quote, cheap Russian oil as a sudden stop could drive up costs for its consumers. And the Netherlands has become the fourth country to stop receiving a Russian natural gas following its decision not to pay for deliveries in rubles. Russia's energy giant Gazprom announced today that it had, quote, completely stopped gas to the Dutch state energy wholesaler Gestera. In late April, Gazprom suspended gas exports to Bulgaria and Poland, and in May, Finland was cut off. Denmark also faces a supply freeze after refusing Russia's ruble payment demand. Moscow's new payment scheme requires gas buyers from countries that have placed sanctions on Russia to open accounts in Gazprom Bank. They can then deposit funds in their currency of choice, which the bank converts to rubles and transfers to the supplies. Coming up after the break, Abramovich completes the sale of Chelsea to a Burley-led consortium. Please stay with us. Let's talk now to Ine John Mekwa of our business desk. Ine, morning. Good morning. Uh, already, I mean, couldn't I skip that discussion with uh, <laughs> Professor Thomas there yes. about the economy and yes. what he thinks is going to happen to Russia and all of that. But mm -hmm. um, this ban, we were talking about it earlier. And um, it's going to have impact, but what kind of impact it's going to have is what so yes. many people are looking at. Yes, well, I don't think there's a lot of question as to what kind of impact it's going to have because even as we speak, we already see um, the cost of energy has increased in Europe and a lot of the European countries, you know, because um, even before this total ban, countries like Germany and some other major countries have been trying to curtail their imports from Russia, so it's already telling. And you know the way the market is, I mean, we've talked about the oil prices here, just a little sneeze, or um, a, a possibility of something happening. happening we see prices, indeed. you know, react to it. So already the inflation, we're talking about the possibility of recession in the UK, in the US, in most of the European countries is all linked to this. So, I mean, we do know the direction is going to take. And uh, just as your guest said there, Russia is also going to feel the impact because a major part of their revenue comes from this. So they're able to sell to China and India, just as you read, but it's not even the same price. I mean, today the price of oil is about 120. Russia is selling at about 80, I think 86 or something. So they are not making the most of it. And because they have limited market, that means they do not have choices. That means they cannot hide their price. They cannot, you know, get a lot of benefits that other oil producers are getting. So we do know that it's not a good one. Um, it's not going to be an easy one. We wait till the end of the year to see how the European countries... And um, they are saying it's going to be 90% because they still want to leave the pipeline um, um, production or pipeline processing for countries like Hungary and all that. Germany, which also does parts of pipeline, I've said they are still going to cut off that's from the northern part right. of of europe you know so it, it's not going to be an easy one for both russia and european countries and even the world at last at large because 
oil at $120. It's, it's supposed to be good news for countries like Nigeria, for instance, but it also has the side effect. We've talked about that a whole Already, lot of times. Yes, Subsidy is going up, and con the, the government is not getting richer. You know, so As a matter of fact, the government is getting poorer. Because, exactly. Uh, yesterday there was a report uh, that the finance minister who was uh, speaking in Davos uh, talked about the fact that even our crude output is is not it's not improving that's it it's and not. therefore we're not making enough even to pay even for, to pay what, for we what we are importing you know and then we still have the increasing subsidy so the government is broke we're still borrowing we're servicing debt we're talking about 90 percent of our income going into servicing of debt it's, it's affecting everybody everybody well we'll have to wait and see how that pans out but russia in spite of everything we've said um, is still playing hardball. Um, <laughs> as we've reported already, yes. uh, uh, the Netherlands have become the latest, the yes, latest target. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They've cut off supply. They've cut off supply of gas uh, through um, uh, their major government-owned gas uh, supplier. They also trade in gas. So that means that Netherlands is going to also fill, apart from domestic demands, they're also going to fill it in their revenue because uh, they also, that company also deals in trading of gas to other smaller companies countries. So uh, it's going to, uh, Netherlands is going to feel that and um, start looking for alternative again, you know, which we don't know which, where, the which, alternative, yeah, where, where the alternative the will come from. The question of where the alternatives are. Uh, because every country is trying to protect itself at this time. Even the almighty United States is trying to protect itself at this time. They have not been able to deal with the hike in the price. So who is going to come to anybody's uh, salvation at this time? Indeed. Uh, the U.S. is sanctioning Russia, and I, and I I remember I was talking about this a couple of weeks yeah, ago. Yeah, the diamonds. Yes, the mm -hmm. Russian diamonds. Mm -hmm. um, and then this is affecting India. Yeah. So in a roundabout <laughs> way... You know, it, it just makes me remember what you talked about yesterday when you said, fine, uh, how many other countries are feeling the impact of this? So India is one of it. So what happens is... Russia, through its uh, uh, big, in fact, the globe, the biggest uh, company, miner, Diamond Dimer, Arosa, partly belongs to Russian, uh, Russia, Russian government. So the raw materials comes from Russia. That's the raw diamond comes from right. Russia. But the processing takes place in India, most likely because there's cheap labor there. So they have like uh, gu Gujarat. You yeah, know, Gujarat, yes. Yeah, you know, like, like an industry for um, uh, stones, cutting and polishing and all of that and you have about a million people employed in this industry in wow. India as we speak 250,000 of them have been told to go home uh, for 15 days but we don't know how long if after 15 days will they be able to come back because what are they coming to do uh, because what has happened is Russia, Arosa is being hit with sanction. Right. Um, United States is not buying Russian uh, diamonds anymore. So where is the market? There's no demand. And if there's, there's no demand, then of course supply is the not going There's to... no point for supply. Exactly. And therefore those workers have nothing to do. Exactly. So that is why from the 16th of May, 250,000 of them have been told to go home, find the festival site by cutting the hours of work and cutting wages. But it seems that they cannot take it anymore. So now India is filling it. So even though they are getting cheap crude they from Russia... They are also Russia, filling it in another way. They are also filling it. In fact, I heard that the union had to protest to the government and tell them, look, this is getting really hard. What are they going to do? And I just wonder what they're going to do now because uh, um, I mean, where do they go to the other market? You have Canada as a diamond market, you have in UAE, but you can't disperse them to start going to those countries to work, Indeed. you know. So uh, it's, uh, uh, it's not... <laughs> it Thank you very like, much. It, 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 we, we, we'll have to see how this works out. We'll have to see how this works out. It's unintended consequences. <laughs> unintended that's, that's spillover effects. That's what that's what I that's what that's what I was saying. So thanks so much. Thank um, you for having me. We'll have more we'll have more of that, of course, on the uh, business programs right after this. Of course, you have business morning, and then later on you have business incorporated. Uh, let's take a look at some of uh, the sports uh, emanating from this. Todd Burley's era as owner of Chelsea has officially begun after he outbid 250 people to the purchase of the Premier League club. Chelsea have confirmed the consortium fronted by the 46-year-old American has assumed control. Burley's £4.25 billion bid was approved by the Premier League and UK government last week, and the deal has now been stamped. 
In selling the club, Mr. Abramovich stipulated that the new owner must be a good steward. The net proceeds of the sale must be donated to charity and that he would not seek the repayment of loans made uh, to affiliates of the club. World number two, Daniel Medvedev, has been knocked out of the French Open by Marin Cilic in the last 16 in straight sets. Cilic is to a 6-2, 6-3, 6-2 win over the Russian star uh, and will now face another Russian, Andrei Rublev, in his third career Roland Garros quarter fight. Starting to uh, return to the streets of the southern Ukrainian city of Mariupol, a resident, Lubia, says she decided not to leave the city despite her flat having been damaged during the battle for it. Nikolai, who said he was once an international journalist and human rights expert, had also come to revive his phone at the market charging points as there's no electricity available at the trade station where he now uh, lives. Some residents could be seen collecting essential products in boxed emblazoned with the pro-Russian war's its symbol next to severely, uh, severely rather damaged buildings. Moscow's capture of Mariupol helped it secure full control of the Sea of Azov coast and create a land bridge linking mainland Russia to Crimea, which it annexed from Ukraine in 2014. The president, Vladimir Zelensky, had described Mariupol as being completely destroyed, but Moscow has pledged to rebuild it. And just uh, before we go, hundreds of Lithuanians are clubbing together to buy an advanced military drone for Ukraine in its war against Russia in a show of solidarity with a fellow country formerly under Moscow's rule. According to a Lithuanian internet broadcaster that launched the drive, some 3 million euros have been raised in just three days out of the 5 million needed largely in small amounts. The drone has proven effective in recent years against Russian forces and the allies in conflicts in Syria and Libya and its purchase has been orchestrated by Lithuania's Ministry of Defense. Before the war started, I never thought, thought I guess none of us thought that we would be buying guns, but I've been donating to to uh, you know foundation that they the, that they were buying guns uh, for Ukraine for two and a half months now. So now it's normal. It's like, you know, it's something that has to be done in order for, you know, the world to be better. So it's a normal thing now. It's weird. Uh, this one, this donation was actually special. It is special to me because I think it's not only really impressive that we can buy a drone, which costs 5 million euros ourselves uh, and donated to Ukraine, but also I think it's very symbolic that uh, while the governments of the biggest countries in the world are, you know, deliberating and debating what can be sent or cannot be sent to Ukraine, uh, which guns to, you know, to buy and choose and whatever, the Civic Society of Lithuania simply comes together, you know, fundraises the 5 million and buys a drone, which is a very strong and very impressive message to the world. Don't know what to say to that, but that's how we're going to end the program this morning. Thanks for being with us. And Maggie Akiri Dilani, there's an update within the world today at 5 o'clock. But for now, do have yourselves a pleasant Tuesday ahead.